Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, we shall take a look at some of the popular methods for data visualization. Uh, so first we shall take a look at plots. So scatter plot is the most commonly used and a very basic tool to visualize the relationship between two variables. So this is how a scatter plot looks like. Um, so this is so on the x-axis we have the number of manufacturing units in the city. On the y-axis we have the city population. This data set is taken from uh, is taken uh, from the U.S. air pollution uh, data. It's available in R. Uh, in fact, uh, in the, in the lab following this video, you shall be working on this data set. So you can see that this is a scatter plot. We can see that um, there is a linear relation between uh, the two variables. And um, we can also see um, that there are some potential outliers in this data set. So uh, this is just the relationship between two variables, but this data set has many other variables. So how can we visualize the relation between each pair of the variables at the same time? time. So that brings us to the scatter plot matrix. So this is a matrix of plots, right? And each plot contains or depicts the relation between each uh, between a pair of variables. So this is how uh, the scatter plot looks like. Um, so here, so this is the relationship between sulfur dioxide levels and temperature. Um, this would be the relation between the manufacturing units or the number of manufacturing units and the population and so on. So in this matrix, we can visualize relationships between each pair of variables. It's important to note that uh, in each of these plots in this matrix, we're only looking at two variables at a time, right? So this plot of um, so this plot of SO2 and temperature, right, has nothing to do with the manufacturing units, population, wind speeds, or any other variable, right? So even though we have, uh, what, six or seven variables here, um, each of these individual plots depict relationship only between only two of these variables. So um, we can, through bubble plot, it is possible to investigate relationship between three variables at a time. So this is how a bubble plot looks like. So on the y-axis, I have the temp, uh, on I have the wind speed, x-axis, the temperature level. Um, these bubbles, right? So in this graph that you can see these bubbles, these bubbles indicate the uh, amount of SO2 levels. So you can see that at a higher average at a higher temperatures, right? The circles are smaller. The, the area or, or the diameter of the circles is small. So this indicates there's lesser pollution or lesser SO2 levels at higher temperatures. If, if you lower the temperature, right, as you go left on the uh, x-axis, um, the size of the bubbles increases, especially here. As wind speed increases and the temperature decreases, there is a lot of pollution in the air. And this makes sense, right? So in the cities, um, it's possible that the winds blow in polluted air. And because it's winter time, the air gets trapped on the surface of the earth. So if it were summer, this air would rise high, right? And would, and would take some of the pollutants along with it. In the summer, the air gets trapped along with the pollutants leading to higher pollution levels. So in this bubble plot, we can look at three variables at a time. Again, when you do the lab, you will see how to plot this bubble plot as well. So in, uh, in the previous scatter plot, we saw that there were some outliers, right? So this brings us to outlier detection. So what is an outlier, right? So outlier is an observation which deviates so much from the ob other observations, right? That it arouses a uh, suspicion that it was generated by a different mechanism, right? So the process that led to an outlier is probably different from the process that leads to the uh, rest of the data. 
So again, this is reiterating the same point, right? So normal data sets, right, uh, or the usual data objects follow some kind of a generating mechanism. Uh, so for example, it's possible that most of the data is generated by say normal distribution or exponential distribution. However, the abnormal objects in the data set or the outliers are generated from some other kind of distribution, right? Which is why they sit away uh, from the rest of the data points. So an example of outlier det uh, detection or of outliers is this. So there was a case of Hadlam versus Hadlam. So Mr. Hadlam, I think, uh, filed a lawsuit against Mrs. Hadlam. Um, so what happened was uh, Mrs. Hadlam had a child 349 days after Mr. Hadlam left for military service right so the child was born 349 days later he left so average human gestation period is 280 days right um so statistically speaking right 349 is far far away from 280 so 349 is possibly an outlier um, so it is up to you what conclusions you could draw from this right So what are some of the other applications, right, of this outlier detection? So one is fraud detection, right? Um, so many times if, if you have a credit card, um, sometimes you'll get a call from your bank or you'll get some kind of a notification saying that you recently purchased something and was this a valid expenditure. So basically the, the uh, banks or the credit card companies, they're tracking your um, consumer behavior or they're tracking your uh, purchase practices and if they see some outlying behavior right like suddenly if you uh, book a flight ticket to Hawaii or you uh, buy some I don't know maybe a thousand dollar dress or something like that then maybe they might think that there is some fraud going on Another important application is in medicine right so unusual symptoms or test results may indicate potential health problems of a patient, right? So outlier uh, results uh, may indicate health problems or uh, if you're lucky enough, it might indicate that there's something awesome going on inside your body. So take a couple of moments to think of uh, some other examples of outlier detection or applications of outlier detection. So how do we detect outliers? So a very uh, commonly used method is box plots. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, right? Um, so box plots are useful for determining, out determining outliers for single variables. So we're only looking at one variable at a time. How do we plot the box plots, right? We first saw the data in ascending order. We calculate Q1, Q2, Q3, which is the first, second, and third quart, uh, quantiles respectively. Then we compute the interquartile range, which is Q3 minus Q1. Then we'll calculate the point for lower whisker, and we'll calculate the point for upper whiskers, right? And then we'll build the uh, box plot, and any points that are outside the box plots are considered as outliers. So this is how box plots look like. This is again from the US air pollution data set. So for the SO2 levels, there are these three points outside the box plot. These are outliers for temperature. There is one point and that is a, and that can be considered to be an outlier. So in the box plot, so here, even though we're looking at box plot for two variables, we're only, so this, uh, this plot is based only on all of the observations uh, in this variable, this uh, temperature box plot is only based on the temperature observation. This temperature does not reflect the SO2 levels in any way, right? So again, we have a multivariate data set. We're interested in multivariate analysis. Is there a way to maybe um, detect outliers based on two variables at a time, right? So that brings us to bivariate box plots. 
and this is how they look like so you will so again when you do the lab you'll get a chance to see how to plot um, this bivariate box plot but so on this plot I have two variables and similar to box plot I have this boundary or these fences uh, uh, this fences in the data set and points outside this outer fence here uh, can be considered to be outliers so note that in this plot, I have also uh, displayed labels for each point. So this dot indicates is for Chicago city, this is for Philadelphia and so on. A lot of times it's useful to have labels to your points and you shall also see how to do that in the following lab. So there is another approach that we can take to detecting outliers and that's the depth based approach. So what this does is it searches for outliers at the border of the data space. Um, it has got nothing to do with any distributions. It organizes objects into convex hull layers. So what do I mean by this? So look at this plot. Um, this thing here, this is the data set, right? So what I'm going to do, so what this does is it forms uh, so it's going to join all of the points right that are in the outer layer so this is the point this is the point right oops and this is one layer right um, then it's going to so pretend that um, so remove all of these points on this layer then again join the outermost points right and so on and you can continue uh, maybe not this one maybe like that uh, so you can proceed till all of the points right till you've covered all of the points so this is how this uh, end figure will look like so the points on the outermost layer have depth one on the uh, second layer have depth two and so on um, so what this says is we can consider uh, objects that are on the outermost layer as outliers So this is based on the assumption that outliers are located at the border of the data space. This assumption may not be true, right? So whichever method you choose to use to uh, pick out outliers, uh, you have to see if it makes sense. So for example, if this is your data set, right? So this is a very artificial data set, right? So which point would you think is the outlier? right so the points along the outer circle or the inner dot so if you go by the depth based approach all of the points on the outer circle are an outlier that doesn't make sense right so visually you if you had to guess an outlier it would be this inner point so always um, see if your uh, results from the particular method that you choose to use are sensible so that's all for um, that's all for this video. Uh, do uh, take a look at uh, do, do take a look at the following lab and make sure uh, you um, repeat it or you do it or uh, on your own. Um, this has a lot of useful uh, functions. So this will introduce you to a lot of useful functions uh, for data visualization techniques. All right, bye. I'll talk to you in the next video.